Dear God, solar roadways, the stupid idea that just won't die. So recently, there have been all these articles saying how amazing it is that there's this Dutch solar cycleway, and it's generated more energy than expected. So burn all of you solar roadway skeptics. And it's repeated again and again and again in the comments on my solar roadways videos, which seems to be like a mecca for people who read headlines but don't understand anything else. Sure, the world energy crisis has been averted thanks to this genius idea of putting solar cells under the road or cycle path or whatever, just because they've generated more energy than expected. Well, actually, no. If you look into the details, what you actually find is the energy production was almost exactly what they expected, which meter squared for meter squared of solar panel is about half of what you would get from just putting those same solar panels on your roof. Let's take a look at the data. As I said, I found uh, three local uh, rooftop uh, solar installations within a couple of kilometers of this uh, solar uh, cycleway. The average is 47.2 kilowatt hours per square meter. Bingo! It's about double what we get from the solar roadways. And there you go. There's your answer. How effective are these solar roadways, solar pathways? We have six months worth of real engineering you know, undisputable engineering data here. So rooftop solar has twice the output of this solar cycle wave. Well, maybe I should try and sell this to some of those solar roadways fans, you know. Hey, solar roadways fans. It's technology that replaces all roadways, parking lots, sidewalks, driveways, tarmacs, bike paths, and outdoor recreation surfaces with solar panels. And not just lifeless, boring solar panels. Have you got solar panels on your roof and want to generate half the power that they're currently generated? Well, you two can do that if you just have this great idea of putting them under the solar cycle path. But they're still amazed that this project has managed to generate enough power to run a house. Well, stop the presses. That's going to be a green solution for global warming, isn't it? Well, actually, no. Nah. Let's just take a look at their numbers there. Their solar cycleway manages to generate about 6,000 kilowatt hours per year. And let's say that goes for about 15 cents per kilowatt hour, which means that on the open marketplace, that would sell for about $1,000 per year, which, of course, would be great if the project didn't cost about $4 million. Fantastic, it's generated more energy than expected. Now all we have to do is run it for another 4,000 years to break into a profit. I mean, you can probably tell by now that this level of scientific illiteracy in the press just winds the hell out of me, and more so the munchkins who repeat it. I mean, you remember that hoverboard stuff, you know, the guy who was going to hover buildings in earthquakes. The ability to load weight onto the hover engine means the technology can one day be used to keep buildings aloft during earthquakes or floods. Why not a building? Why not a house? Why not an operating room? Why not a sensitive piece of equipment or a precious piece of art? Okay, so step back for me, like, tell me how this technology works in the first place. I'm an architect, not a scientist. And so I looked at this whole problem a little bit differently. If you can hover a train, why not a house? And that's where the idea came from. Uh, we have a low-tech version, a way of decoupling structures from the earth in the event of earthquakes or floods or rising sea levels. What did he just say? Hover houses. If you can hover a train, why not a house? In the case of earthquakes, floods, and rising sea levels. A way of decoupling structures from the earth in the event of earthquakes or floods or rising sea levels. Are you crazy? Did you see that tsunami footage? Yeah, I can imagine them now watching their houses get washed away saying, damn, if only we'd listened to Mr. Hendo and they'd installed the technology that allowed us to levitate our houses a couple of centimeters or inches above a copper or aluminium surface. Our houses would be safe now. In the event of earthquakes or floods or rising sea levels. Rising sea levels. Are you out of your mind? And all of the time, this Forbes reporter is sitting there, just sitting there like a lemon, like this isn't crazy talk. 
Uh, yeah, and then this week we've got National Geographic pimping them. And then the cherry on the top of it all. The BuzzFeed blue team sitting there like melons while this guy tells them with a straight face how he's going to hover houses during earthquakes. See, right? They fire up the engines, they pull the supports down, so this stays completely in the same place, but there's all this magnetism that's saving everybody while the earth is shaking wildly under it. The earth is like, okay, I'm done. The supports come back up. Everything's good. So we were like, of course, you could probably, with a million engines, lift anything, but that's gotta cost a fortune. $13.10. That's what we're talking about, what it would take to hover a house, energy-wise. I mean, let me just remind you a little there. As for hovering houses in earthquakes, this is the least preposterous thing he said here. So let's take a look at that. You've got to be kidding me. Look, buildings weigh about, let's say, 40 tons for a regular building. Which means at 40 watts per kilo, you would need a stable power source of 2 megawatts just to levitate your building. That's enough energy to run about 2,000 microwaves. That's kind of a high energy spike to expect to be able to sustain in a house during an earthquake. Look, obviously, seeing as the grid power supply is going to be one of the least reliable things in an earthquake, relying on it to save your house by levitating it might not be so smart. And just so you know, this is what a local 2 megawatt power supply looks like. So you would basically need one of those in every house. And you even get people claiming to be science communicators going so far to call bullshit on real scientists debunking their bullshit claims. So this is Cara Santa Maria. After I've comprehensively shown that the claims of this air carbon or air plastic were bullshit. And she simply says, this video has no backing evidence except his own calculations. Uh, yeah. That's what scientists tend to do. Their own calculations. And in this case, just for good measure, I ran those calculations past a top-tier climate scientist who was visiting our lab at the time. And yet the climate scientist was really pissed off about this air carbon stuff too, to the point where we even had several serious conversations how it would be a damn sight easier to get cash for research through some bullshit scheme like this, predating on the scientific illiteracy of the public and the scientific communicators if yep, it would be a damn sight easier to get money like that than getting funds through a research council. Imagine there was a cheap way to reduce greenhouse gases that actually generated cash for you. Sounds too good to be true, but it's not. Thanks to a recent scientific breakthrough, this is now possible. Not only does our new technological discovery cool the Earth by harvesting light that would have otherwise heat the Earth, it actually removes greenhouse gases from the atmosphere at the same time. Not only does this green biotechnology pull carbon dioxide out of the air, it also creates biopolymers that can be turned into things that you and I use every day. This discovery works, and it's been replicated all over the world. But now, we need your help to continue this research. I mean, wouldn't it be awesome to live in a world where the technology both cools the earth and removes greenhouse gases, which would fight global warming? I mean, could you look into your children's eyes and say, yes, yeah, son, when I was young, there was this cool technology that could have saved the earth, but, but we just didn't want to invest in it. So the business went bust. And that's why we're here. Could you live with yourself? Could you look in the mirror? I mean, it's just a shame they can't smell the scientific chasm between the claims being made and what is physically possible. $13.10. You may think it's too good to be true, but here I am, sitting on the proof. This chair is made from air carbon, a material that's doing its part to protect the Earth's ever-warming climate. I mean, don't get me wrong, she looks a damn sight better in front of the camera than I do. But at least I understand the stuff that I'm talking about. Yeah, they are my own calculations. But let's be real, they're not terribly complex calculations. Like how many years does it take for this solar roadway to break even? Or how much you're going to reduce your carbon dioxide footprint by making a cell phone case? You'll recall that humans breathe out about one kilogram of carbon dioxide per day. That's just your carbon footprint for being alive. And then you have all these people from CBS just gasping with awe at how someone has maybe sequestered 50 or so grams of carbon in a cell phone cover. 
So I know this sounds more like magic than science, so I wanted to make sure you guys could actually touch and feel this. So you each get a cell phone case. That's for Nora. Mm -hmm. Charlie That's loves for Charlie. Yes. I got him in Pink Charlie's favorite color. color. That's right. And you, it's very hard to read, but on is. there it says, pulled from the air for yeah. Nora O'Donnell, Charlie Rose, oh. Gail King. Oh, I so see. So yeah. that carbon would otherwise be up in the air, heating the atmosphere. I mean, seriously, that's only about one twentieth of their personal daily metabolic carbon footprint, and they're impressed by it. And how does Kara wrap up her story on air carbon? And who knows? The next time you buy a cell phone case, you could be doing your part to combat climate change. I'm Kara Santa Maria for SoCal Connected. Yeah, assuming all of the claims that they made about this cheap plastic from the air are true, which they're not. A science communicator thinks that a 50 gram cell phone case is going to fight global warming when her daily metabolic carbon footprint is 20 times that size. And her annual metabolic carbon footprint, that's just, that's just what it takes to keep her alive by breathing in and out, is about a third of a ton of carbon dioxide. And her annual typical footprint as a Western is going to be about 20 tons. <laughs> sure, a 50 gram cell phone case. That's going to be a game changer. Yeah, they are my calculations. But then again, that's kind of what I am. It's kind of what I do. I am the one who checks. But this really does get up my goat when you show something is categorically bullshit and you still get people cheering for it like it's some great idea and people just lap it up again and again and again. And by the way, if you really did want to build an efficient solar cycle way, look, let's just say that a solar panel that tracks the sun has a 100% efficiency for comparison. Now, if you don't track the sun, you just have a fixed solar panel, then you lose about half of that potential. That is, your solar panel is now operating only at 50% relative efficiency. And if you light flat on the ground, as you would in say a road, you're now down to about 30% efficiency by the simple act of geometrically laying these panels down flat on the ground, you are throwing away about 60%, two thirds of their potential power generating capability. You know, one where the panels are angled to get more sunlight and they're not obscured by covering it up with a road surface or anything like that. This is how you would do it. Yeah, it's just a regular solar installation apart from it doubles for a roof of the cycle path and it's simple and easy to maintain and so on. 